Welcome to another episode of Spotlight Podcast. Today I have a special guest. Dr. Peter Eckersley is an associate professor in public policy and management at Nottingham Business School. His research focuses on central local government relations, public policy, climate change, sustainability, and public accountability. He supervises PhD students and chairs a support network for early career researchers. Dr. Eckersley is a managing editor of Local Government Studies and co convener of the UK Political Study Association's specialist group on local politics. Alongside his post at NBS, Dr. Eckersley works part-time at the Leibniz Institute for Research on Society and Space in Erkner, near Berlin, where he teaches climate policy in German cities. Before joining NBS, Dr. Eckersley worked as a postdoc in the Department of Politics at the University of Sheffield, in the Environmental Department at the University of York, and at the Newcastle University Business School. His PhD in political science from Newcastle University highlighted how constraining intergovernmental systems in England and Germany led one city in each country to adopt very different approaches to climate protection. That will be the predominant theme of this episode based on the two of Dr. Eckersley's latest articles that he successfully co-authored. Dr. Eckersley, welcome to the Spotlight Podcast. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. As an icebreaker question, could you please tell me a little bit about your academic journey? Yeah, well, my academic journey, I suppose, almost began before as an academic in that I, I worked in the local government sector for, for about just over 10 years. Um, initially for the, the Chartered Institute of Public Finance and Accountancy, which is a, an accountancy body for local government finance directors in England and England, Wales and Scotland. Um, and and then I started doing my PhD while I was still there. And my PhD, as you say, was on climate protection in English and German cities. Um, and then I went through various kind of yeah, postdoc positions before I started here at NTU in, in, in 2018. And then I started at the, the Leibniz Institute, you mentioned before, also in 2019. I've always been interested in local government. And I think that that stems from my professional experience before as an academic and kind of comes through now in, in, in my research and my teaching now, um, in, particularly in, in terms of what, what local government tries to do and how it goes about doing what it tries to do, um, trying to achieve its objectives, essentially, working within specific constraints that are shaped by the central government that it works or operates underneath and also by the local context within which it operates as well, local kind of political and environmental and economic and socioeconomic um, conditions that, that lead to perhaps particular, uh, particular decision-making or particular policies that might work in one or might be more appropriate in one context, but perhaps less appropriate in another. And I suppose comparing these different localities, comparing different cities and looking at what they've done, I think is really quite interesting. It tells you about quite a lot about different places and what different places and the people who live within those places think are important to them um, and perhaps are the best or most appropriate ways of, of trying to achieve what they want to achieve. Um, locally in terms of policy outcomes. We can see uh, in today's world uh, this rite of passage in, in terms that uh, from professional field uh, people enter into the academic world. C- could you tell me a little bit uh, about this uh, connection in your case? Well, I, I mean, I was still, I was still working um, for the first two years of my PhD. I was doing my PhD part-time to begin with. Yeah, I, I enjoyed working for the Chartered Institute when I was when I was there, but at the same time, I I wanted more of a kind of an intellectual challenge around what local, how local governments operate, in addition to the um, kind of the management challenge and the um, the ad, kind of the advisory challenge that I was involved with when I was working professionally. So, uh, but at the same time, I went into the academic world with quite a lot of you know, background based knowledge of, of how local government works, particularly in the UK. Um, because I'd spoken to people who, you know, work within it on a daily basis, and it was it was part of my you know my, my day job. Um, so that that certainly I think gave me a uh, a bit of a head start when it came to starting my PhD because I, I had better understanding perhaps of uh, the particular context that I was going to research than maybe some other PhD students did, and, and then subsequently. You know, probably helped as well because maybe I was able to 
get more publications out or get my PhD done quicker than, than would have been the case for, for some of my students that started at the same time as I did. As mentioned in the introduction, um, we will focus this episode primarily on the climate change in relation to the local municipalities, uh, local authorities. Uh, both studies emphasize the dynamics of urban uh, climate policy. Uh, what commonalities and differences do you observe in cities navigating and prioritizing mitigation and uh, adaptation efforts? Mm -hmm. They all face the challenge, and certainly all of the most of the cities that we've looked at in any kind of depth are, are keen to tackle the challenge. It's not as though there's a um, a lack of ambition in most places. I think that, uh, that I mean, the two studies you refer to look at, at German cities, and we looked at um, we looked at in one paper we looked at I think about twenty one or twenty two in in relative depth, and in the other one we look at over hundred hundred and five. Yeah. So um, yeah, obviously the the, the, the more in depth one where we where we did interviews um, as well as kind of you know document analysis and this kind of thing and in some cases we had you know, kind of in depth quite in depth relationships with some of the the people who worked in those municipalities as well. Um, there was certainly no no shirking back from the the idea that this was a, a massive challenge for them and that they they were really keen to try and tackle it. Um, but then the level of the challenge was was very different in different places as well and this depended. To some extent, on the uh, kind of the geographical location and the its um, its vulnerability to climate impacts. So some places are more likely to flood, for example. Yeah. Some places more vulnerable, more vulnerable. Yeah, more vulnerable. Yeah, some places are more vulnerable to flooding, more vulnerable to storms. Some are more vulnerable to heat waves or drought. And uh, some, if they're in coastal locations, perhaps to you know to storms and or flooding on the seaside, um, coastal erosion, perhaps as well. So in terms of their adaptation challenges, they, they can be very, very different. And also in terms of their mitigation challenges, so mitigation being trying to reduce carbon emissions, essentially, um, rather than necessarily adapt to the inevitable consequences of climate change. In terms of mitigation, uh, the political context was, was very different in some of these places. And, and so some people found it much easier to, to push forward with ambitious policies than others because there was far more support in local in the local population or amongst local politicians um, or uh, in the local media or also amongst other kind of local actors as well. So some some of the more you know, progressive cities that we identified were much more likely to have a, say, close partnership with the local university. So they get a lot of support from the local university for developing a strategy, um, for perhaps collecting relevant information, this kind of thing. This is very interesting. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. This is very interesting because I saw you you made the comparison and uh, distinguished between the cities and you basically grouped the cities in accordance to the, let's say, the main theme within the city, as you mentioned, the university being university cities, mm -hmm. like Heidelberg and some other cities, and also some with industrial background. Uh, can you tell me a little bit more about this grouping? We, we came up with, with three different groups, groups based on kind of common category, uh, characteristics and um and we, you know, we kind of acknowledged that in some places there was a bit of overlap between the different groups. So exactly. we had we had university cities, as you mentioned, we had industrial cities, and, and we had historic cities as well. So cities with a, you know, a kind of historic city centre, for example, that may be under some kind of UNESCO protection, World Heritage right. Protection, for example. Um, places where the, the municipality is perhaps less able to change the, the fabric of the city, um, either to combat you know, the effects of climate change or to reduce um, carbon emissions. To so, align with any kind of uh, policies, I to guess. A, yeah. Um, but and so, I mean, it's, it's certainly as far as the historic cities were concerned, a lot of them had universities. And so there was a lot of overlap there. Mm. Um, but they did have specific challenges, perhaps, but perhaps also opportunities in terms of what they were able to do. So, um, so they weren't able to easily, for example, retrofit some of these historic buildings you know because they're under monument protection you can't just put solar panels on top of a you know on top of a cathedral that easily for example um or you can't um change the windows to make them more uh you know, more energy efficient exactly. the whole building so um so there were a lot of problems associated with that trying to make these things you know emit less carbon mm. but at the same time actually these places because their city centers have been protected there hadn't been any kind of push back in the in the sixties 
to knock down these historic buildings and build motorways, for example, which has happened in a lot of the industrial cities and has happened here in the UK in some places as well. That you know, that because these uh, because these historic places were seen as really important to the lo- to local identity, to local ideas of belonging and and place, and also um, some of them are tourism attractions. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So they don't want to. To change. Yeah, they don't want to throw that baby out with the bathwater. They want to make sure that they're still going to have a tourist industry mm-hmm. and they want to make sure that, you know, in order to do that, they need to protect these these important uh, physical assets in most cases. Um, and, and as I say, that also meant that um, perhaps it made it easier for them to introduce park and ride schemes, for example, or um, public trans- more you know, widespread public transport within the city centre to ensure that people didn't drive into the city centres perhaps as much as they would do otherwise. So, the, the, you know, benefits and drawbacks of these historic cities, essentially. Um, on the industrial cities, I don't know if you want to talk about those yeah, as well, yeah. We kind of, we grouped these almost into two as well. We weren't able to arrange quite as many interviews with people in industrial cities as we wanted to. Um, and I think perhaps one reason for that is because in, in most cases they're not quite as ambitious as the historic cities or the university cities because they haven't got as much support from the local population or from local politicians to um, to push forward an, a more ambitious policy. Um, but those that we did look into, some were in coal mining areas, for example, um, where there was a lot of opposition to, to anything associated with climate policy um, in terms of the political representation on the council, but also in the local population. A lot of people's jobs were dependent dependent on these industries. Ideally, we would have spoken to a few more people in these kind of places, but we did actually try to interview them, and they said, well, we don't think we can provide you with any relevant information because actually we're not really able to do very much Mm. because of the the local opposition. There were some other places which... um, So one example would be Ingolstadt, which is where the headquarters of of Audi is. Mm. Um, And, um, you know, although it's highly dependent on the you know the car industry, industry. obviously the local it's not a big place um actually it's a wealthy really wealthy city because people who work in audi get paid a lot of money not just the not just the you know the people that put the cars together but all of the you know, kind of the technical people who design them and you know are involved in research and development for the for the audi corporation so um but we found actually you know they were probably a bit more likely to want to push forward with climate policies than those where, you know, where the industry had, you know, was either kind of old industry in inverted commas, so coal mining, or where a lot of these places, you know, steel, steel and coal being classic examples had closed down or were, were, were in massive decline and not many people were involved in those industries anymore. So, um, this is something very interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, and I will come back to this, uh, subject of uh, cross country comparison, mm-hmm. uh, especially it is interesting to, to compare the Northeast part of England, uh, with these old industrial cities in Germany, I guess. Uh, but something that I always intrigued and, also had an opportunity to ask Professor Malgan from UCL the other day to compare the individual intelligence and collective intelligence, how we can compare uh, on the side of the um, individual affairness of the climate change as an issue and uh, when we come to the collective side of it. Those kind of issues were were right, right at the forefront in, in some of these industrial cities. I mean, Cottbus is one that we looked at in particular, which is on you know, on the on the border with Poland, um, very heavily dependent on on lignite lignite brown coal mining, which you know is just about the the dirtiest fuel that that has ever been 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 burned. Um, but uh, also, you know, a very deprived city as well. You know, and, and I can completely understand that people that live in those places, think that, you know, actually we, we've got other priorities. You know, the, the council should be look, thinking about our general well-being and not about climate change, which I'm affects everyone. I'm af- always yeah? afraid to say well-being because also we, we connect well-being to the climate change in, in a certain sense. That, mm-hmm. That's why I'm hesitant mm-hmm. to connect the, the, ter- the two terms. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think you're, the... the an oft cited answer to these kind of questions is that all the all of these issues are, are interlinked. And if you're talking about sustainability, you're talking about economic well being and social well being as well as environmental well being. Um, and and I don't think you can talk about climate justice if you don't talk about social justice, because ultimately, actually, 
the people who are least able to deal with the impacts of climate change are the people who are, you know, are most vulnerable at the moment and, and actually the people that, that haven't got the resources to, to combat it themselves. And, I mean, th there was another study that I don't think I did send you that we were involved with where we looked at cities across Europe and actually we were interested to see what their, um, what their policies or wh whether they considered the impact of climate change on vulnerable groups in their climate policy strategies. Um, because disabled people, for example, older people, much find it much more difficult to move about if there's going to be a flood, or if there's going to be a heat, heat wave, or exactly. something like that. They can't get away from these from from these risks anywhere near as easily as somebody of you know of my generation. If you can't, if you've got your own transport, for example, if you, you know, if you were in a in a care home, um, you know, you're entirely dependent really on other people in most cases to for, for your you know, for, for your well being. You can't do many of those things yourself, and so. Um, you know, if if you, if people are going to, if, if there's going to be climate justice, there needs to we need really need to think about the impact of of climate change on these vulnerable groups and get them you know ideally involve them in decision making a bit as well and think about you know what is it that um, that they might need um, in order to make it easier for them to to get by yeah, in, to in these the kind challenge, of yeah. yeah in these kind of uh, eventualities. So. Uh, city size emerges as a critical factor in both studies. Mm -hmm. uh, how does the size of a city influence its ability to implement impactful climate policies? Yeah, I mean, we found, generally speaking, bigger cities had more ambitious climate policies than smaller cities. Um, I think there's a, a lot of... What do you think It's a predominant factor? Well, there's lots of different things associated with it. I mean... The, there's, I mean, we're not the only people that have said this. There's been a lot of studies that have found this in the past as well. And um, I, th I think the, the the most prominent, or perhaps certainly the easiest um, justification for that is that these places have got bigger municipalities, more people working for them, more resources. They're more they're more likely to be able to develop uh, develop policies that or have the knowledge to inform policies that might be appropriate or suitable for the local context. Um, and have and employ people that have got the expertise that might be necessary to do it, you know, to develop the policy and also to implement it as well. So, um, and I think that yeah, you know, that's there's certainly a, that is a large element of it. Um, at the same time, bigger cities tend to have a lot of the other kind of characteristics that are associated with more ambitious cities as well. So they tend much more likely to have a university, for example. Um, particularly research intensive university that might be more likely to work with the municipality on, on developing policy, much more likely to have a younger population, um, partly because they have more students, but but also generally speaking, cities tend to have a younger population than than, than you know, rural areas in particular. Um, younger people tend to be more in favour of climate action than older people. More um, aware. Yeah. More aware. Tend to be wealthier um, than smaller places. But um, at the same time, as you mentioned, uh, larger cities in general are more vulnerable to the heat waves, to rainstorms mm -hmm. of any kind. And if there are also the coastal cities uh, from all the impacts that can... No, that's right. So, I mean, I think, you know, all, all of these things contribute towards you know, a more, more fertile ground, if you like, for an ambitious climate policy, because there's there's more understanding and more support in the population and also within... You know, elected politicians for for action. So, I mean, the, you, you obviously you mentioned that you know, bigger cities are more likely to experience heat waves because you know there's been you know, it's common knowledge now amongst scientists that you have this phenomenon called the urban heat island, and so you know a urban area absorbs heat during the day and takes a while for that heat then to dissipate overnight, and so. Uh, I mean, there's been all kinds of studies that have shown that you know, large cities in particular, the temperature in the middle of that city might be five degrees warmer than it is outside the city, um, where there's, there's more greenery, there's not as much concrete to absorb the heat. Um, and, uh, and obviously all of the, the kind of the sealed surfaces that you get in, in a city as well, roads and pavements and um, car parks and these kind of things, I mean that in the, not only do, they, do those surfaces absorb heat, but in the event of a storm, then all the rain just washes off those and collects in, in low-lying areas and you get flash flooding. And whereas obviously you don't get that in, 
or anywhere near so much in, in, in smaller cities and in, in the countryside. Both studies reference historical pathways as critical. How have past decisions and policies since, let's say, 1980s shaped the current climate actions of German cities and maybe in comparison some UK cities as well? Yeah, I mean, we, you know, we found that those cities that started earlier uh, generally tend to be more advanced now than those that have, have come later. And, um, I mean, it's not really that surprising a finding in that you know, you'd expect that the momentum that they would have developed and the, the policies they would have implemented already would have, you know, it's easy then to build on them to generate the, the, uh, the momentum almost to, um, to take things forward or further forward perhaps than those that come, that come a bit later. Um, I mean, that was certainly the case in, in Germany with cities like Freiburg and Heidelberg and, um, and Münster. I mean, you know, they, right in the beginning of you know, the, the 90s, basically, they started doing things about climate protection in particular, mitigation. Um, uh, and generally speaking, those that were you know, earlier in mitigation were then a bit earlier in adaptation as well. Adaptation in most cities didn't really become an issue until kind of the late 2000s maybe i think most even even in germany most cities didn't really develop a plan until kind of about 2015 um and there's still quite a few of them that haven't developed one yet either um and i think that applies to an extent in 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 the uk but probably not to the same extent and i think that the um probably the reasons for that are more about the the lack of stability in, 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 in local government in the UK compared to in Germany, both in terms of its structures. And we see it's much easier in, in, in the UK for, for the central government to say, well, actually, we, we think we should merge these two authorities together because we, we think that this is, they're too small or we think that they've, they've had problems in the past and they'd be better as a you know, bigger area. Um, and, and financially, they're far less stable as well. We've seen austerity since since 2010, and I know you've spoken, obviously, to, to Pete Murphy about this in the past as well. So uh, some cities in, in, in the UK, um, particularly in England, who you know were quite progressive in the early turn of 2000s, places like Leicester, um, Kirklees, and Sutton, London Borough of Sutton, perhaps are not quite seen as the pioneers anymore. Um, though some places, more, you know, more like Bristol and... and uh, um, and places like that, I think, have you know, have kind of maybe overtaken them a bit, um, in a few Scottish cities as well, Glasgow in particular. Like I say, it, it's it's it certainly helps if you start earlier, um, but I think the thing that also helps is is a, a stable policy making environment that you can you know that how much money you're going to have to spend in in future. Or you've got a better idea, um, perhaps also a stable political environment as well, because of the electoral system that we have in the UK. It's much easier for for a city council to go from one party control to another um, in the same way as it is at Westminster in national elections. Um, because in Germany you have a, a much more proportional system. Um, you have a broader spectrum of parties represented in the council mm. chamber. Um, but it's, it's less likely that actually there'll be a, a change of power from one party to another. Uh, can you elaborate on how funding programs impact the ambition and effectiveness of climate policies, especially for smaller cities, focusing on adaptation measures? It gets back to what I was saying before about the stability of the, the policy-making environment, particularly where there's no that there's no stability. Where, where so in, in the UK we have we have an annual budget system um, and we have annual grants from central government to local government. Mm. So in most cases. You know, cities don't necessarily know how much money they'll have to spend in, in next year or the year after and things like that, and they can't plan. Um, climate adaptation or mitigation is not, it's not a, a, a mandatory service that they have to provide. It's not like ch- children's social care. Uh, it's not like adult social care. Um, it's not like um, uh, the w- waste collection. So, um, so that's another reason why sometimes it's, not as much of a priority as it would be otherwise, because when budgets are squeezed, it's something that they don't have to focus on. And so that means in that in those kind of situations, uh, they have to go and look somewhere else for money. Um, and in the UK, there's not many other places they can go for this kind of funding anymore. Um, in Germany, it's, it is a bit different. I mean, obviously, it's a very different political system. We have a federal system. Um, the federal government has been providing funding for German councils to do first mitigation and now adaptation as well um, so any council that that wants to do it can 
submit a bid and in pretty much every case that bid is then approved and they're provided with money then normally to employ someone to be in charge of climate protection or adaptation and also then to develop a plan to say, to say what they're going to do in the coming years about it. In addition to that, some of the, the states within Germany as well have got their own schemes that councils can apply to and say, well, you know, we're, in addition to the federal money that we want, we also want some other money to look at to develop partnerships, for example, with universities or with other neighbouring municipalities to do things, so. stakeholders, this kind of thing. I mean, normally it has to be kind of attached to a specific initiative, mm. but at the same time, there's there's more pots of money for councils to apply to. There's also EU money as well, um, which obviously we haven't got here. In that sense, there's, there's more funding available to German municipalities than there is to, uh, to English ones in particular. One issue with it um, is that this funding tends to be kind of project-based. Mm. And so... The funding will be for, say, for three years or for five years. Um, and so the, the authority might appoint someone, but it'll only be on a temporary contract until that, that funding runs out um, or until that, uh, that plan has been developed and published and approved. And, I mean, interestingly, most municipalities that we've spoken to that have employed people from these, cent these, these federal funds, once that funding has then expired, they've continued to employ that person and paid them centrally from their salaries come out of the municipal budget rather than from the external funder um but that's not always the case yeah because it brings another level of pressure yeah. to the yeah yeah local mm -hmm. budgetary constraints i guess mm -hmm. so i mean the, you know the 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 issue of financial um you know sustainability and, st and stability is, is is quite important in all of this and um money isn't always available for for all of the municipalities that want to do it um and i was as we said before you know bigger Bigger places tend to have more money. They tend to be wealthier. They tend to have more staff. They tend to have more expertise. And for them, it's not as much of a challenge then to employ someone in, to be responsible for this or to develop a plan. So the, the federal funding in Germany in particular, in particular has been very important for smaller places mm. that haven't got those resources. Uh, balancing synergies and trade-offs is a recurring theme in both studies. What strategies uh, do prosperous cities employ to navigate the decline balance between the mitigation and adaptation? It's difficult to say, but I think it's certainly fair um, to argue that cities find it easier to stress the balances yeah, rather than the trade-offs, the, the synergies. You know? mm. so, the, um, so planting trees is a classic, classic example of a, of a synergy, yeah? Exactly. So it's something that absorbs carbon from the atmosphere. It's also something that provides shading in the in in hot periods, and it's also something Sun. that absorbs water and prevents from fl prevents flooding. Okay. So, you know, pretty much any municipality that's developed a climate policy has said we need to plant more trees. Um, and that goes to central governments as well, national governments. Um, so that's an easy one, yeah? There are much more difficult ones, particularly around... Um, housing for example so we talked before about the urban heat island effect and how densely populated areas tend to retain heat overnight and they don't cool down as far as adaptation is concerned this can be a quite a significant problem can also contribute towards flash flooding mm. at the same time you don't necessarily want urban sprawl you don't want people to be you don't want to allow building companies to build on the outskirts of a town and make that to make that town geographically bigger and bigger and bigger and take up more territory because that in itself is bad for adaptation because you have far more surface area covered by asphalt and by homes and by cars and things like that and yet it's much more difficult to develop a public transport strategy in those situations as well when the when people are more spread out they're much less likely to take the bus much more likely to drive though. yeah so this this is a I think a very difficult problem to address um, because I mean kind of urban planning theory in the sixties was yes we should allow people to drive cars we should build in the suburbs we should you know we should allow people to have gardens and you know, spread out if they want to spread out and yeah, it's lovely if you can do that but at the same time you know the shift in the, in more recent times has been well actually. Um, we need to protect green spaces that are outside of cities and we need to make sure that people live close enough to each other that they're more likely to access public transport. It's easier to do things like build um, tube lines and build tram systems in built-up areas than it is to 
um, out to, into the, the suburbs. So uh, Both studies aim for international uh, applicability. How can the frameworks developed be adapted to use in different countries? Well, the, the one that we've not, the people we've not talked much about is the, the 104 cities one, where we developed a uh, almost kind of an assessment framework to, to see how active a city was in terms of adaptation and also in terms of mitigation. So this, the, the idea behind that was that um, it would be a relatively objective assessment of, of what the city is doing. So we incorporate lots of indicators in there around the quality of its plan, for example. Um, the, so in terms of mitigation, things like you know, its targets for emissions reductions, um, the, uh, whether it's achieved any kind of awards or prizes for its policies in the past or for what it's achieved, um, and uh, whether it's members of international networks that are, generally speaking, are seen, you know, those cities that are members of international climate networks are seen as being more active than those that aren't, um, or at least the city takes it more seriously. Um, uh, so we have a whole suite of indicators around mitigation for those that I think are not just applicable in Germany, but are also applicable elsewhere. Um, in terms of adaptation, it's more of an analysis of, what, of what's in the plan, the sectors that are covered in the plan, the issues that are covered in the plan, whether it doesn't just cover heat or flooding, for example, but also other issues like coastal erosion in those places that are on the coast, um, storms, um, flash flooding, this kind of thing. Um, the uh, again, there's there's kind of networks and there's prizes and award schemes for for cities that have been active in this area as well. So they're all incorporated into that. Um, and so essentially, we have kind of a we we, we allocate points in terms of medi- mitigation and, and adaptation to each of these 104 cities, tot up the points and come up with almost kind of a league table at the end, which we're not saying is you know definitive in any in any stretch of the imagination because we're only able to, the, the, the nature of the assessment is we're only able to look at what is publicly available. We're not able to assess the extent to which any of these in- initiatives have been implemented. For example, we'd need to actually go out there and you know, mm-hmm. that would be a far different study and a far bigger study, particularly if you're talking about over 100 cities. And we're actually involved in another paper now to update this one um, to see uh, how those cities that fared well in in the the previous paper where we, I think we had 2019 as kind of the cutoff date, Mm. how they got on in more recent years. So with the cutoff date of the end of 2022 and 2019, see if there's any dynamics to compare, to compare them, see if, see who's kind of, you know, got up the table, who's gone down the table and try and come up with some kind of, you know, explanation as to why that might be the case because things have changed a massive amount since since 2019 in these four years, in these four years. I four mean five. yeah <clears throat> I mean it was China just at the the cusp of of, of Fridays for Future movement coming al- along then for example and nobody really had declared a climate emergency back then and in fact nobody had when we did the previous study um, so there's a lot of other things that that, that make us think actually you know, that ranking system we did then is probably already a bit out of date and it would need updating, even if we think that the principles might be internationally applicable. Um, the nature of you know, dynamic public policy is that you always need to kind of keep up to date with the most recent developments if you want to get a proper assessment, a proper understanding of what's going on. The studies suggest analysing future trends and developments. What trends do you foresee in evaluation of urban climate policies? The indicators that we that we have used or that other people have tried to use to assess them will continually need updating. Um, not just because the policy environment changes, but also that the threats might change as well. Um, you know, there's potentially some impacts of climate change that we haven't really felt yet that would need to be in, incorporated Completely into any future. Completely unaware of. Yeah, yeah, we don't know. Um, and uh, and if you want a more, perhaps a, no, a more nuanced assessment, particularly of adaptation, perhaps we need to incorporate a city's vulnerability into that assessment as well, because some cities are not vulnerable to coastal erosion. Some cities are not really vulnerable to heat. When, when, I, when I look at climate policies adaptation in the UK, the big concern is flooding and severe storms and the impact of, of pluvial flash flooding within cities. Um, when I look at climate adaptation in Germany, in most places, the big concern is heat waves. Yeah. Yeah. Similar to to Balkans, uh, mm-hmm. where I'm coming from, Podgorica and Belgrade, all the capital cities in the region, they, they experience these huge heat waves during the, the summer. But something that 
uh, spark in my mind it was from from one of your classes where you actually point out that um, uh, during the rain season in, in England, a lot of water goes just to the disposal. The sewage system in the UK was designed 150 years ago, yeah? And um, when far fewer people lived here, and when far fewer people had flush toilets, um, pretty much nobody did. And so the, the demand and the volume of sewage that goes through these systems yeah. is, is, is outstrips the capacity of the system. Exactly. In the event of a, a, of a severe storm. Because not only in, in most places, particularly those that were built you know, in, in the 19th century and also the beginning of the 20th century, um, not only does household wastewater, so not just from the toilet and the bath, but also from sinks and washing machines and dishwashers. Um, that all goes into the system, but then it gets mixed with the rainwater as well. Exactly. And so there's, there's, there's basically too much water for the system to deal pressuring, with. Pressuring yeah. the system. And so what the water companies end up doing is just Dispose. disposing it into the sea or into rivers. Dr. Eckersley, thank you so much for your time stopping by talking about this uh, very important topic. Uh, for for all of us thank you pleasure